Well, hello and welcome. Well, this unmistakably is Rose Hill Gardens, the home of the richest two-year-old event in the world. And one that Shane Dye has won no less than four times. He started in 1989 with Corza, followed it up in 1990 with Canny Ladd, Terse in 1991 and Burst in 1992. Shane Dye made the race his own, as you'll hear in the commentary from John Tapp. This is about to run into third place and she's finishing on gamely. So is Ken Fair. Van O'Sullivan is shortening stride. Loving Cup and Burst down the outside is rocketing to the line. Burst has swapped Van O'Sullivan four straight for Shane Dye. When it comes to golden slippers, the other jockeys might as well stay at home. Of course, Shane Dye was no stranger to controversy, but love him or hate him, you couldn't argue with his riding record. Over 2,000 wins, 93 of those at Group 1 level. I caught up with Shane at his home base on the Gold Coast last week for a chat about the wonderful career of Raymond Shane Dye. To me, Shane Dye was one of the great showmen of racing. He, he, was, he was more than just a champion jockey though. He, he had a way of making the sport exciting. Um, he, he talked the sport up. He wasn't afraid to say things that were controversial and he had a way of keeping his name in the headlines. But he walked the walk as well. He could talk the talk and he could walk the walk. Because if you think of Shane Dye, you also think of some of the great moments in Australian racing. He was a, a champion jockey might not have been the most gifted of horsemen but he made the most of his abilities and tactically I think there's been none better than Shane Dye and there's a classic example of his win in the 1997 Chipping Norton Stakes on Octagonal. It was one of the all-time great rides in my opinion. Um, he knew there was one horse to beat that was Juggler. He knew that Juggler had a superior turn of foot than Octagonal and so if it was a sit sprint Octagonal couldn't beat him. So what did Shane Dye do? He took off mid-race, made it a stamina test and Octagonal won brilliantly that day. But there were other great rides as well. His four wins in the Golden Slipper, his win on Burst is one of the all-time great Golden Slipper rides. But Shane Dye being Shane Dye, he also had other controversies as well. And probably the most famous one was the Viander Cross incident in the 1992 Caulfield Cup. But Steve, I'm sure you spoke to Shane about that, and no doubt with Shane Dye, he still says he did nothing wrong on Viander Cross. His record will go, ensures he goes down as one of the all-time greats. Um, I wrote many columns for, for Shane for News Limited. I always found him extremely loyal, very genuine, um, honest to a fault. I became quite friendly with Shane over the years, and to this day I'm proud to still call Shane Dye a close friend. Well, Shane, thanks for your time this morning, and I really feel like I'm with racing royalty. <laughs> Don't know about that. I've been long gone, actually, you know, like I stopped riding more or less in about 2011, 2012, sometime around there, so I've been off the scene for a long, long time. Well, for a good deal of my career, uh, I was lucky enough to photograph a number of your race wins, and I remember when you rode Terse to win the Golden Slipper, I think that was your third win? Yeah. I'm looking through the lens and I'm thinking, this can't be Shane Dye again to win this race. And of course, not only you won that race, you won the following year with Burst. So you hold the record, which is pretty a great achievement, sharing it with Ron Quinton with four wins. It's funny, you look at it as a record, I don't. I look at it that I should have won probably seven or eight. <laughs> if I stayed in Sydney, like, you got to remember that. I was riding for Gay. Yeah. I left in 2000. Gay hadn't won a Golden Slipper. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we wouldn't have broken up. There's no risk about that. We had a great relationship. And, of course, I had Encounter, you should have won. I got off Prow. Redoubt's Choice would have won for sure. You know, like I could have won 10 Golden Slippers if I was around and things had gone right. But yep. Uh, yep. I was still lucky to win the four, and it was great. It's a fantastic race. It's Sydney's race. Yep. Yeah. And it's, they've got to keep putting that prize money up for the Golden Slipper because they talk about the Golden Slipper all around the world. It's the one race people know. Yep, yep. Well, let's go back to the beginning because I read somewhere where you started riding track work at age 10 or 12, yeah. is that right? Yeah, I was riding gallops when I was 10, 12, uh, 9 probably, you know. Wow. I was very young. I had a proper race course. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So um, that's part of the system then in New Zealand. In Australia, we're not producing great jockeys early on anymore. We don't do it. There hasn't been a superstar champion apprentice since Darren Beatman in 1984-5. Mm. 
Um, Darren Gauchy was a superstar. Damien Oliver was a very good apprentice. He's yep. a superstar jockey, but wasn't a superstar apprentice. He was yep. a great apprentice, yep. but not a superstar. Yep. They don't produce them here because you can't ride track work until you're 16, mm. which is just ridiculous. Mm. It's like putting a tennis racket to Andre Agassi and saying you're not allowed to play tennis until you're 16 and then go and do something. He mm. was playing tennis at two, mm. Steffi Graf. Mm. You've got to be doing it all your life to be a superstar. Yep. You just yep. don't come on the scene and do it. Yep. So the system yep. in Australia is wrong. Yep. Uh, it doesn't work. Yep. If it had worked, there would be superstar apprentices, and it's just not. Yep. But you went on to win two New Zealand apprentice titles before you came to Australia. Yeah. So you had the runs on the board before you came to Australia. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I remember reading or hearing something about when you when you make a prediction, pretty much comes true. And did you say that when you came to Australia, you would make yourself number one rider for TJ Smith? And you did. I probably, I can't remember. I always wanted to. Yeah. Because he was, you know, what did he win? 36 premiers. Correct. And it was the goal of everyone yeah. to be a yeah. stable job. Yeah. I got there. Uh, Mick kind of handed it to me. He, if he had stayed, he would have been, but yep. he was on his way out. He had had enough and wanted to come back to the Gold Coast to live in. Yep. We all know what a superstar jockey Mick was. Sure. And him and Tommy had a good relationship, even though he didn't go to track work all the time. No. <laughs> Tommy loved me yeah. because I was always at you, track, you work. track work. Yeah. I, I love track work. I'd yeah. sooner go to track work. And I used to say this. I'm not going to the provincials to yeah. ride, yeah. but I'll be at track work every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like um, I left – I only rode for two years in New Zealand. I left when I was 18. Yeah. You know, I was young to come to Australia. And my first year in Australia – I run third on the Sydney Premiership at the age of 18 behind, um, I think it was Jimmy Cassidy and, and Mick Dittman. Yeah. Yeah, that year. Yeah. 1985, 6. Well, TJ was just a, a phenomenal race trainer. Kevin Langby used to tell me that when he was stable rider for TJ Smith, he'd go to the races on seven favourites. And if he won three out of the seven, that was a good day. I mean, what made TJ so good? Well, he was very unique. He knew every horse. Um, I could be riding track work for Bobby Thompson or Graham Rogerson, and he'd be walking off the track to go home, and I'm walking back in. And he knew that horse. Mm. He'd say, oh, he looks good, that horse, you know, such and such, and name it. Um, he, he was ahead of his time. Yep. You will find that in any profession, anyone who's a superstar is always ahead of their time. Yeah. That's why they're so good. Yep. They, they pick things out and do things a bit different. Um, but uh, he worked his horses hard, but when I got there, he didn't work them as hard. You know, he was pretty good on them. And uh, we, we were very, very good, but he was a man's man. Yes. I'll give you a little story about Tommy Smith. I won the Queen, uh, the Grand Prix on a horse called Dorset Dance. Yes. And he was in the derby, and I was riding a filly who I'd won the Oaks on in Adelaide called Lee's Bid for um, Inghams. Yep. And I was riding her in the Oaks up in Queensland, and then I was meant to be riding one of them, whichever one in the derby. So anyway, the Monday comes after I win the Queen Elizabeth on Dorset Downs. Tommy rings me. Jane, Jane, I need to know, are you going to ride this horse? Otherwise, Mick Dittman wants to ride it. Put Mick on. And I said, well, I'm riding thing next week in the Oaks, and she's going to run in the Derby. Yeah. But she can't beat Dorset Downs, I don't think, in the Derby. I, I'll ride Dorset Downs for sure, but I can't come out and say that just in case they take me off. Yeah. And, um, but I'm definitely going to ride Dorset Downs. He's the better rider. Yeah. And he said, all right. All right, all right, I won't do anything. That's as good as gold. The next morning in the paper, there was a story, Tommy saying that he doesn't know whether he'll wait for me till after the Oaks to for Dorset yeah. Downs and that Mick may be on it. Yeah. So he went and headed did a story that, so I could keep yeah. the ride on yeah. Dorset Downs. <laughs> he was unbelievable like that. We had a good relationship. We yeah. never had an argument. I think the only argument we had was on um, Nothing Like a Dane and yeah. the Kinnan Stakes. Yeah. Yeah, before the Melbourne Cup. <laughs> he wasn't very happy with that. Well, 
I talked to Malcolm Johnston uh, a couple of years ago, and of course, Malcolm's always known for riding Kingston Town. But I asked Malcolm, I said, apart from Kingston Town, there must have been other horses which you had a high opinion of. And he mentioned the horse Ico. And you mentioned before about Encounter. Well, Encounter was something special too, but he never got the recognition that he that he, that he deserved, really, did he? No, I think I won six group ones. Yeah. And he retired as a three-year-old. Yeah. He definitely should have won the Golden Slipper. You know, he shied at my stick, run out and wins. He won the Champagne Stakes, he won the uh, signs, but he come back. But he was a very hard horse to ride. I, was, I think he had about 30-something starts mm. in his career, mm. maybe late 20, 20, maybe 20-something. Yep. No other jockey rode him. You know, I was the only one. Yeah, I think you had like every, every, 22 rides 22 on him. 22 rides yeah. on him and yeah. no other jockey. He was very, very difficult to ride, that horse. Yeah. Um, he didn't like the stick. Yep. And the only time I really hit him was in the... Um, Caulfield Guineas. Yep. And for some reason that day he won it. Got a beautiful run on the fence, but he wasn't getting around Caulfield. I didn't hit him hard, but I did show him the stick a lot that yep. day, and he responded to it, and he just got up and won. But you could feel underneath him he didn't like it. Yeah. So you had to kid to the horse. Yeah. You know? Yep. Um, and you had to time your run right. Like, I think I won the George Main Stakes. Yep. And I was on him like this at the 100 metres, a neck behind whatever was in front, just sitting on them. And everyone would have thought, this is going to win easy. But when I let him go, he found that neck or half length to just win. Yep. He never went boom to put them away by three. He used to look around and pull up. Yep. He could have, yeah. but he didn't do it. Yeah. He had a few chinks in his armor. Yeah, and yeah, started. yeah. In 1989, you win the Melbourne Cup, the race that, virtually every jockey, not only in Australia and New Zealand, but probably internationally now wants to win yeah. on Terrific. Um, Corey Brown tells me that uh, when he won his first Melbourne Cup, it's an eerie feeling when you pass the post because the crowd's not cheering anymore, it goes silent, and the only person you're next to see is usually the person on the pony that right, comes back to you. Was that how you felt when you won it? Um. No, I think it, it hit me that it was all my dream. Yes. You know, as a kid being in New Zealand, it's yep. all I ever wanted to do. Yep. Every first Tuesday in November, you get home from school, do a sweepstake, yep. watch the race with all your family, and it was as as big as the Melbourne Cup it is in Australia. Yep. It's the same in New Zealand. Yep. You know, it's very, very big over there. Every trainer wants to win the Melbourne Cup. You know, they, they get all those old stayers. It doesn't work anymore. It yep. can't work anymore because the European horses are too good. Yep. But in those days, they weren't around. Yep. And every trainer in New Zealand would want that old stayer to set for a Melbourne Cup yep. with the weights and everything. Yep. So one of the first people to congratulate me pulling up was my best friend, Lance O'Sullivan. You know, and we'd grown up together, so it was special. Yeah. Um, but uh, I knew what it meant, don't worry about that. But you don't appreciate it as much until years go yes, by. Yes, yes. And you look back and you see the stigma around it and how everyone just loves and talks about the Melbourne Cup and then you appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, it's a it's a it's a great race when it comes around, and I, I can I can obviously never imagine what it feels like to ra just have a ride in the race. Yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking last year when young Dylan Gibbons had only been riding for about three years and finds himself with a, a lightweight ride in the Cup. What a thrill it must have been just to go around in the Cup, you know? Fantastic. I mean, Shane, we could sit here and talk about the horses for the next week about that you've ridden Shogun Lodge, Dane Wynn, Slight Chance. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Octagonal must be special to you. Yep. The win that I remember you on Octagonal, I think it was a Chipping Norton Stakes at Warwick Farm, yep. where you dared to take off at about the 800 metres and caught them all napping and won the race. I think that's one of the ones that sticks in my mind. Um, yeah, but I didn't go out to do it that day. That just happened. Just happened in the and race, yeah. how people look at that being a great ride and something like the Andercross being a bad ride. Yeah. I don't, they're both the same. Yeah, sure. I made decisions. Yeah, and yeah. And whether they're right or wrong, it's irrelevant. They yeah. were the right decision at the right time. Sure, point. yep. And people don't look at it that. No. You've got a small frame. If you get beat ahead, they'll criticise you. If you win by head it's different and that's probably why um i stayed at the top for so long like i was always at the top in australia yes. i never went backwards no. when i left australia in 2000 i was the number one group winning rider every season yeah yeah um 
and I could put it out of my mind. Yeah. Or if there was a steward's inquiry and they had me in over a ride and it was, you know, um, uh, postponed for yeah. a week and they wanted to know and they'd postpone it and do things, I'd just walk out saying, these blokes have got no idea. Mm. They don't understand. Mm. And I used mm. to look at it like that. And then it didn't affect me, so it didn't change my riding. And I think the trouble today is... Um, jockeys are too scared to do a lot of things in races because of the stewards and speed maps and all that. And you've got to be an individual, you know. All, all the great jockeys are individuals. You know, you go and watch Ryan Moore ride. Ryan Moore's just on another level. Yep. He, he's just beautiful to watch yep. in a race. He's different. But I can bet you now he doesn't think about what stewards are thinking before a race. No, no. The thing that I've always remembered you for, uh, on and off the track, is that you've always exuded confidence. Has that always been part of your persona? I oh, definitely, yeah. even at school. Yeah. You know, when I was playing tennis or whatever it was, I was always this tennis champion, running champion or whatever, yep. you know. But I just believed in myself and I worked harder than most people at that stage. Yep. Um, and if I couldn't win or do things, I thought, well, how can I do it? And... Um, I wasn't taught that. I was born with that gift, same as in life. Yep. Everything goes wrong. A lot of bad things have happened in life to me. Don't worry sure. about that. Yep. But I never look at them as being bad. I look at them as a stepping stone to make me a better person and then to achieve more. Now, how can I go about correcting those mistakes? Yep, yep. How, we always fall into this category of, uh, oh, this horse is better than Kingston Town. and that, It's very hard to compare the horses, the champion horses that yeah. you rode to the champions today. Uh, as far as riders is concerned, what, what what do you think of the present co crop of riders? You mentioned before that we, we've got the system wrong because we don't allow them to ride earlier en enough. Um, do we have a present good cop crop of riders? James McDonald obviously is, is the cream of the crop. Um, yeah, James stands out. He's the best yep. rider in Australia by yep. a long way. He's outstanding. There's no risk. He's probably the only superstar there is in Australia. Whereas in my area, you had Darren Beedman, you had uh, Jimmy Casty, yep. you had Mick Dippman. They're all superstars, you know, definite superstars. Yeah. Um, Jamie Carr's outstanding. She's very, very good. Um, there's a few new apprentices in Sydney that are pretty good. I've been watching. They all ride pretty well. So something's changed. And then I asked someone, yeah. and they said, Corey Brown's taken over. Yeah. Yeah. That's why all of a sudden you've got a few new. He's changed whatever they were thinking or yeah. doing. Yeah. Because we went, what, 20, 30 years with not a good apprentice in mm. Sydney. There mm. just wasn't. Mm. So the system was wrong. But with Corey there, he seems to be doing a very good job from what I can see from an outsider. I went... When things change in life or it's not correct and then something's different, I always like to know, okay, what's what changed? changed? Why is all yeah. of a sudden? Yeah. And I asked a few people and they said, oh, Corey's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I put two to two together and that's the only reason. You yeah. Know? So um, you got got um, Lloyd, he rides well. Yep. Um, um, still got a bit to go in big races. He should have won the Cox Plate for sure last year. Made a mistake not going to the fence. All he had to do was go to the fence and it wins. But I find a lot of jockeys, including James McDonald, mm -hmm. they don't ride the fence, which is very bad. Yep. Um, but James went to Hong Kong last year. And he will tell you this. Since he come back from Hong Kong, he's a lot better jockey. Yeah. Because he's happy to ride the fence and save ground. Yep. Whereas before he would rather be out of trouble coming around, making a yep. run at the 600 to the 400 yep. and the horse is too good or it weakens, but it's had its chance. Whereas I would rather be on the fence somewhere waiting for a run. If it gets held up, I don't care. It's unlucky. Whereas the jocks today don't want to be unlucky. If you look at Ryan Moore, right, he rides the fence all the time. He just wants the fence. Yep. It doesn't matter whether he's last or whatever and he doesn't leave the fence right and he just makes his own luck through the races but james is a, a is a real superstar yeah. he could go anywhere in the world and yeah. ride and uh, he's done very well and if he stays in australia he'll break all records mm. as if i'd stayed in australia mm. but mm. at the end of the day records are made to be broken and who cares mm. You mentioned Jamie Carr. Of course, when you were riding, there was very few female riders in, in, in the jockeys' rooms. Now, they have to build uh, jockeys' rooms for ladies in, in different race courses to cater for them all. There's so many of them. Well, that actually started when I was riding the girls. Um, see, see, with the system of, of 
Australia today. Guys aren't going to come along and be jockeys, hmm. okay? So now we're into a digital age, computer games. Kids would rather be inside boys playing kid computer games than be going to stables or yep. mucking around with horses. Yep. You also got to remember that the pay of to work in racing is very, very low for apprentices. They can't drink, they can't do drugs, and I don't care what anything anyone says. Drugs is a big part of society now, whether it's legal or illegal, it doesn't matter. They're here and they're here for good, right? I don't do drugs, but I just know they're everywhere, right? Young kids experiment, want to do drugs, they want to go out party. If you're an apprentice or a young person, you cannot do that. Mm. You can't do drugs. You can't drink. You've got to be up at four o'clock every morning working for a low amount of money. Yep. So you've got to actually love horses and love it, and yep. that's your dream in life. Yep. Yep. But because you're not riding all the time before, you don't have that dream. Yep. Yep. Girls are different. Once a girl loves a horse or ponies, they love them for life. Yep. Yep. That's just their word. Yep. I've seen it with many girls. I know a young girl going through it yep. now, yep. and she's an outstanding rider. She's only young, 14, 15, but just loves it, lives yep. it, yep. right? So you're always going to have more girls come along, and in 50 years' time, they're going to outnumber the boys yep. by a long, long way. Most apprentice jockey boys are bred, right? The father to son. Whereas sports like tennis, you'd hardly get any kids playing that sport. But in racing, jockeys are bred, yep. you know. Yep. Um, of course, we're all growing and getting bigger, so you're getting less guys. Yep. But um, the girls are going to outnumber the, the... And the way it's going, it's all set up for them. It's not about strength anymore. Before, it was about the stick and strength. Now it's not. And horses run for girls, so there'll come a stage and girls will be way up there. Here's a random question for you. Would you have made a good steward? I do make a good steward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I make a fantastic steward. Yeah. I heard you... A lot of stewards don't understand things. Well, this, this is the point. I, I, I think I, I read somewhere or saw something, that, and I agree with you totally, yeah. that how can you have a steward's panel without an ex-jockey on the panel? Yeah. Well, the, they make a, the biggest mistake a steward makes, right, and this is a fact, when they're coming across and the horse on the outside's coming across, yep. this jockey here's here, but he's using them and doing yep. the damage, yep. right? Yep. But this jockey here always gets the blame, and he's only to blame probably one and eight times, one and ten, or three and ten times. Yep. It's yep. always this bloke using him, sitting a length and a half. Yep. If I was a steward, like that, just wouldn't happen, yep. right? Because it's not this bloke's fault. And I actually got someone off on that. Peter Valor run me in New Zealand years ago, and he wanted James was riding in New Zealand probably 10, 12 years ago. And I was holidaying, and he said, can you have a look at this? James has got suspended. And I said, it's not even his fault. Mm. Give me the transcript. So I looked at the transcript. He said, he's got to ride my horse in a Group 1 race next week. I said, they've suspended the wrong jockey. He's not to blame. So he said, well, can you come in and explain? And so James appealed. I went in, and, of course, he... He, he got it reduced so he could ride, and he won the Group 1 race for Peter, which was great. But he should never have been charged. No. It was just wrong. I took one look at it and said, oh, my God, once I explained this, you'll get off. Mm -hmm. He actually didn't get off. They reduced it, and I walked down. The committeeman was laughing at me. <laughs> How could you not even let him get off that? He said, oh, we've got to keep everyone happy. <laughs> Well, Shane, I know we could talk uh, all week about um, your career and your highlights. And like I said, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I, I class you as a racing royalty, and, and thanks very much for spending some time with me. I really appreciate it, Shane Dye. Thank you. Nice being here. Good as gone.
Thank you.